Um, can you um, talk about some other um, benefits, whether or not they're surprising or whether or not they were predicted from doing the NSF slaughter um, program? One, one uh, definite benefit, if a stream okay. has wild trout in it um, and there's a permit comes to a DEP um, and that stream contains wild trout, any activities on that stream are limited. Any construction activities are not allowed to, not allowed to happen from the fall until around the following spring. And that's to protect the wild trout during that critical spawning period. A lot of people really don't realize that that's, that's part of the permit process, but that's an important one for us. And that's, a, that's an important reason why we have to document wild trout, because they can be protected during their spawning season. And if these, if companies and developers know that, in advance, they can operate around that. Um, so it's kind of important. Uh, the other factor is surprising. We are surprised at how many significant populations we find with the NSS Waters work. We actually thought we had them all in the past. But when you start to dig into some of these streams and some of these watersheds, we're finding some <coughs> Uh, pretty significant populations and have been applying the proper protections for it. So it gives us a really good idea of the distribution of wild trout around the state. Chuck, you as a representative of Chestnut Hill Township, you have some first-hand experience with um, developing in an exceptional value uh, area, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, back in about 1992, I believe, was when Michael Creek first got designated to exceptional value. And I would encourage you to look at research the Pocono record from July of 1990 to March of 93 to hear some of the comments that were out there about what this was going to do. And in fact, what we wouldn't be allowed to do because of this. Here's what actually happened. In the 25 years since 1995, roughly, we had 20 plus land developments. These are all in the McMichael Creek watershed within, only within Chestnut Township. 20 land development plans for non-residential uses, 71 subdivisions, 313 newly landed residential lots, all within the McMichael Creek watershed. The Josh Moore project, which was acquired oh, probably in the year 2000 property, the purchaser paid $400 an acre more than the township could pay because we can only pay fair market appraised value. You have to ask yourself why, if this was such a bad thing as far as residential development in particular, why someone would pay $400 an acre more to get into that market. In that project, there were 80 or 90 lots transferred from a property using transferable development rights outside of the Michael Creek watershed. Second question, why would somebody transfer development rights into a watershed where it was going to be harder to do business? It simply wasn't a fact. Uh, the, full, the sewage disposal is all within the watershed, lagoons and spray irrigation systems, uh, the transferable development rights we talked about. Along with that, the Local Land Fish Association uh, did an 800 acre easement which is managed by the Pocono Heritage Land Trust and opened up half-day fishing permits, I believe 40, which for all the stuff we heard about public access in these properties, I think we had one year where we maxed out and all those permits got issued. So now, fast forward. 10 years out of that 25 years, the economy crashed. Development never got built. It was scheduled for approval, I believe it was October 4th, 2005 we would have voted to approve that project. It went south because the economy just flat. The individual that bought it came to the township and said, we don't like it for open space. We subsequently did buy it. The important part of, of this to remember is those transferable development rights, the fact that it didn't slow this down. And part of the boundary of this project, the large part of it, is within a 1,000 feet or less 
of the free flowing water in McMichael Creek. No problems with that project whatsoever. Beforehand, sort of like the disconnect sometime between what's legal and not legal and the science of the water we drink and, and the water we're using. So, I mean, I would take the flip side of this point a little bit, which is that um, and one reason why a lot of um, different groups are interested in protecting headwater streams, because ultimately it's all connected. So the headwater streams are flowing down into larger and larger systems, and more often than not, it ends up being drinking water. Two thirds of the water in the United States that serves our drinking water is from surface water. Um, and so if you contaminate a first or second order stream and it flows down into your reservoir, that's an issue. Um, and so the issues of being high quality for EV, the things that are going to protect the habitat for trout and other species um, are the same things that are going to protect that water for you and I to drink. So there's absolutely a linkage in terms of the real world. Whether or not that linkage is there in terms of legal terms <laughs> is another issue.